we're going to look here at differential equations where we study exponential growth and decay. Our work that we do isn't probably too dissimilar what, in what you might see in a pre-calculus class, but we now have the context of calculus to help us understand what's going on. So one of our most common separable equations is what is known as um, an, one for exponential growth. <clears throat> and here's how you recognize it. The rate at which y is changing is proportional to y itself. So some common things. Um, the rate at which your balance in your bank account increases is proportional to the balance in your account. The more money you have, the greater or the faster or the, the more interest you'll get out of that. The way we write this in words, the rate, that's the derivative, is proportional to, means it's some constant multiple of y. <clears throat> K is called the relative growth rate. Why do we call it that? Well, if we divide this equation by y and solve for k, we will have k equals 1 over y multiplied by dy dt. So if I tell you that a city grew by is growing by 500 people per year, that's not terribly astounding if the city has 5 million people in it. If the city has, if the city has 2,000 people in it, then it's growing pretty significantly. That's why it's called the relative growth rate. You're multiplying, or you're basically looking at the size of the growth relative to the size of the population. If you use separation of variables, you already have the dy and the y over there. If you set this up as k times dt equals the integral, <clears throat> oops, not the integral, we're not there yet, but dy over d over y, and then integrate, you'll end up with a natural logarithm on the right side, which you saw when you solve it produces an exponential function. <clears throat> so we're going to use the solved formula throughout this lesson. If we know that the rate at which a function is changing is proportional to the function itself, dy dt is ky, and y, we know what y of 0 is, then we end up with this equation. So your function, y, will be equal to the initial population, or whatever we may be talking about, balance, times e to some power k times t. We're going to use that formula. We don't need to recreate it through differential equations, so we get to use it for free. Here I have an example. <clears throat> a bacteria culture has a constant relative growth rate of 0.672 cells per day. At the beginning, there are a total of eight cells. We want to find the population after 10 days. Well, we're told it has a re constant relative growth rate. That means that we're dealing with an exponential growth function. It also means that k is equal to this 0.672. You can kind of feel think that of this as a percentage, so it's kind of like 67% growth per day. That's very fast. Uh, the further we are from zero, the less accurate that statement becomes, but it's something kind of like that. <clears throat> At the beginning, we know there are eight cells, so we know that y of zero is equal to eight, which means our equation is y equals y zero e to the kt, or y equals 8 e to the 0.672 times t. We want to find the population size after 10 days, so that's a very straightforward. Evaluate your function at 10, and we end up with 8 e to the 0.672 times 10, which equals 6,631 after we round, of course, because we don't want to talk about partial cells. The next question asks, when will there be 100,000 cells? Now, we're up to 6,000 some cells. When will there be 100,000 cells? Well, this is basically asking us for when does y equal 100,000? So we'll set 100,000 equal to 8 e to the 0.672, we don't know what t is, that's the when part of our question, and we solve. Divide both sides by 8, we end up with 1,000 or 12,500 equals e to the 0.672 times t. When we take the natural log, we have the natural log of 12,500 equals 0.672 t, and we find out that t is the natural log of 12,500 over 0 
and our calculator will tell us that this is 14.038 days. So just a little bit more than 14 days, we're at 100,000 cells. And at 10 days, we we're only at 6,600 cells. So you can see this is growing quite rapidly. Wash your hands. <clears throat> Okay, a little nod to Dr. Seuss here. The number of truffula trees is decreasing exponentially. So uh, this phrase decreasing exponentially is of course the indication that we should use our exponential growth function model, of course. Initially 34,000 of them existed, but after five years only 21,000 exist. So we wanna find an equation for the number of truffula trees after two years. <clears throat> We know that y of 0, or y0, is equal to 34,000. We don't know what k is, all right? When we talk about this model y equals y0 e to the kt, y and t are variables. y0 and k are what we call parameters. Once we know those, those for a particular model, those remain the same. I know what y0 is, it will always be 34,000, but I don't know what k is, so we're going to figure out what that is. <clears throat> the way we're going to do that is make the uh, observation that after five years, 21,000 existed. So that means if t is equal to 5, y will be 21,000. So we'll have 21,000 equals 34,000. Now where are these coming from? That's y equals y0 e, e to the kt. Well, I don't know what k is, but I know that t is 5. So k times 5. <clears throat> Divide both sides by 34,000. We end up with 21 divided by 34 after reducing a little bit. That's equal to e to the 5k. And when we take the natural log of both sides, we get the natural log of 21 over 34 is 5k, which means that k, I like to do it with fractions like so, one-fifth of the natural log of 21 thirty-fourths. <clears throat> so we want an equation for the number of truffula trees after t years. Well, let's put this in. Um, I'm going to leave it as an exact answer with, with the natural logarithms. You're more than welcome depending on your instructions, to use a decimal approximation, but I think we'll get some more intuition if we use an exact answer. I'll explain that in a moment. So we end up with y equals y0, 34,000, <clears> e to the k. Oh my gosh, I want to keep that. One-fifth of the natural log of 21 thirty-fourths times t. Okay, so here is where we're going to use some properties of exponents to make it look a little bit nicer. I see e to the natural logarithm, but there's some other junk in the way, the one-fifth and the t. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'll show you that in a slow motion, essentially, 34,000 e, let's match that natural log of 21 thirty-fourths with that, and then say times t over 5. Now, why did I do that? Because there is a rule of exponents that says if you have <clears throat> a to the m to the nth power, you get a to the m times n. We're used to reading in the formula the way I just wrote it, but let's read it backwards. Let's start with the product because we have the product of those two things and write it where we have something raised to a power to a power again. So y will be 34,000. Um, e to the natural log of 21 thirty-fourths, that's going to be one expression, and then we're going to raise this to the t over 5 power. The magic of this is we end up having the e and the natural log do their magic together, their inverses, so we end up with 34,000, 21 thirty-fourths to the t over 5. <clears throat> Okay, I like that a little bit better than throwing the constant in, and here's a reason for that. Observe the t over 5 that's here. That's basically dividing our timeline into five unit intervals. If um, t is equal to 15, 
t over 5 would be 3, which is 3 5 unit intervals. Now, what about the 21 34ths? The 21 34ths is the ratio of the number of trees that existed after that 5 years to the number of trees that existed <clears throat> 5 years prior to that. So it's essentially the multiplication factor that we have every 5 years. Okay, so... For a second part, we want to know when there will there only be 13,000 of these poor little truffula trees. Well, in this case, y is equal to 13,000. And we'll put this into the equation above. So I'll have 13,000 equals 34,000 times 21 thirty-fourths to the t over 5, and we solve it like we did before. There's a slight difference, but not too dissimilar. Divide by 34,000, we end up with 13 34ths equals 21 34ths to the t over 5. Now here's where it's slightly different. Up here, when we had the exponential expression, we had e to a power. Down here, it's a different number to a power. So we could do things base log base 21 34 it's kind of a silly thing to do instead we'll just take the natural logarithm of both sides so the natural log of 13 34 <clears throat> will be the natural log of 21 34 to the t divided by 5 and we can use a rule of logarithms which says if you have the log of something to a power we can move that power down out front so we're going to move the 2 over 5 in front. Natural log of 21 34ths. And if we multiply by 5 and divide by that natural logarithm, we'll find that t is going to be 5 times the natural log of 13 34ths divided by the natural log of 21 34ths. <clears throat> and that's approximately 9.976, which is kind of interesting. That actually is really darn close to 10, which is two five unit intervals, right? And that makes sense because if you look at the ratio of 21 to 13, versus 34 to 21, they're approximately equal to each other. So there's a good reason that this is almost two of those five unit intervals. Sugar making. During this process, there is a process, a step called inversion, where we convert the sugar, um, the cane sugar is dissolved in the water. The rate at which the quantity of unconverted sugar is changing is proportional to how much is there. So we've got the sugar that's in the sugar cane. The rate at which that is changing is proportional to how much is there. So the rate at which is changing is proportional says we're dealing with another one of these y equals y zero e to the kt business ones, exponential growth. So we know that the initial amount is 550 kilograms. We also know that 400 will be present after 10 hours. We want to know how much is left after 15 hours. So we first need to find the equation for this, and then we need to um, figure out what it is after 15 hours. Let's see here. Um, so we've got, I've got y equals y0 e to the kt. I don't know what k is, but I know that after 10 hours, y will be 400. Our initial value is 550 e to the k times 10, t, t is 10, so I'll write that as 10 times k. <clears throat> divide both sides by uh, 550, we end up, I'll div divide by 10, we end up with 40 over 55, which reduces to 8, uh, what would that be, 8 elevenths. <clears throat> That's equal to e to the 10k. Take the natural log of both sides. The natural log of 8 elevenths is 10 times k, which means that k 
is one-tenth of the natural log of eight-elevenths. That was what we needed to know, so we'll put this all in. Um, I'm going to put it in and do some simplification. Uh, let's see here. So we will have y equals 550 e to the k, k one-tenth of the natural log of 8 elevenths multiplied by t. We'll do the same manipulation we did before. y will be equal to 550. I'll bring the e and the natural log stuff together, 8 elevenths, and that will be raised to the t divided by 10. Again, that t divided by 10 is counting how many 10 uh, hour intervals we're dealing with. <clears throat> And this turns out to be y equals 550 times 8 elevenths to the t over 10. We want to know how much is present after 15 hours, so we just substitute y equals 550 <clears throat> times 8 elevenths to the 15 tenths. And this equals 341.12 kilograms. <clears throat> okay, so now it asks us at what rate is the unconverted ch sugar changing after 15 hours? At what rate? So when I see the word rate, I want to think derivative. I am looking for dy dt when t is equal to 15. Hmm. Well, wait a minute, we do know something about 15. So what we could do, and this is what I'm going to recommend that you not do, we could take our equation up here, <clears throat> find the derivative, and once we have found the derivative, multiple, or substitute 15 in for t. But I've already done something at 15, right? When t was equal to 15, the rate was 341.12. Let's go back to the very beginning of this entire video. We talked about the fact that dy dt is some constant multiple of y. Well, we know what happens. At time 15, we know that y is equal to 341.12, and we also know that k is equal to not something pretty, but 1 tenth of the natural log of 8 elevenths. <clears throat> Let's put that all in. So we get 1 tenth of the natural log of 8 elevenths multiplied by the 341 0.12, and this is approximately negative 10.863. <clears throat> so our last question here, oh wait, we should put some units on that. That would be in kilograms per hour. So we're losing um, about 11 kilograms per hour after 15 hours. All right, when will there be 100 kilograms left? This is not uh, terribly difficult question. We've done it many times before already. We're going to take the equation that we have up here and let y be equal to 100. So we've got 100 equals 550 times 8 elevenths to the t over 10. Divide by 550, we'll end up with 2 elevenths after we reduce, equals 8 elevenths to the t over 10. Take the natural log of both sides, the natural log of 2 elevenths equals the natural log of 8 elevenths to the t divided by 10. Bring the t over 10 out front, the natural log of 2 elevenths <clears throat> equals t divided by 10, natural log of 8 elevenths. Multiply by 10, divide by that natural log, and we find that t is 10 natural log of 2 elevenths divided by the natural log of 8 elevenths. And this is 53.532 hours. <clears throat> Before we do the next example, we need to define something. A half-life is not a quantity amount, it's actually a time amount. A half-life of some substance is the amount of time it takes before the substance is, decays to half its original amount. 
In humans, the half-life of caffeine is about five and a half hours. It varies by person and so forth. But um, an 8.4 can of Red Bull contains 80 milligrams of caffeine, and we want to find the caffeine level after T hours. Very similar to what we've been doing before. Because it decays by half every 5.5 hours, that's an exponential decay kind of model. Our initial value is 8, or 80, <clears throat> so we'll have y equals 80, and then it's e to the k times t. Well, wait a minute, I'm going to have to back up a minute. Half-life, the half-life is 5.5 hours, so I can put the 5.5 in there. Half-life means I'll only have half of that 50 left, which means that this should be 40 instead. Divide both sides by 80, and we'll get one half on the left side by design, because it's the half-life, e to the 5.5k. Take the natural log of both sides, the natural log of one half equals 5.5k, and so k will be one over 5.5 times the natural log of one over two. Putting this in, we have y equals 80 e to the 1 over 5.5 natural log of 1 half times t. That's k times t. And I'm going to go ahead and do the two steps at once now. We're going to take advantage of the e to the natural log of a half. <clears throat> e to the natural log of half will equal 1 half. And our final formula is 80 y equals 80, e to the natural log of 1 half is 1 half of t divided by 5.5. So this is a place where I can really see the formula working. The t divided by 5.5 tells me how many half-lives we've experienced. If t is equal to 11, for example, then we've gone through two half-lives. Okay, so every time we reach a half-life, we cut things in half. We multiply everything else by a half. So we're building up factors of one half, as indicated out in front. <clears throat> we want to know how much caffeine is left after two hours. Well, it's certainly going to be more than 40, because it takes five hours to get down to 40, or 5.5. But all we need to do is plug two in for t. Two divided by 5.5. And that's about 62.18 milligrams. Okay, well now let's figure out when there are five milligrams left. So that means the y is equal to five, t is unknown. So we'll have five equals 80 times one half to the t divided by 5.5. When we divide by 80, we end up with 1 16th equals one half to the t divided by 5.5. Just as before, we can take the natural log of both sides. The natural log of 1 16th equals the natural log of 1 half to the t over 5.5. The natural log of 1 16th is t divided by 5.5, natural log of a half. If we multiply both sides by 5.5, we find that t is... 5.5 natural log of 1 16th, and I'm going to divide that, since t is multiplied by the natural log of 1 half, we'll divide by the natural log of 1 half. When we put this into the calculator, we end up with 22. Okay, it's not 22.0000061, it's not 21.99997, it's flat out 22. So let's see if we can understand why that's the case. Let's take a little chart here. Here is time, and here is the amount left. We start off with 80 milligrams, but that's not the time, that's the amount. That's at time zero. Every five and a half hours, this gets cut in half. So after five and a half hours, we're at 40. After another five and a half hours, we're at 11 hours, we'll be at 20. Cut to five and a half hours later, we'll be at 16.5, we'll be down at 10. And lo and behold, at 22 hours, 
we cut it in half again, and we end up at five. So that's why we got a nice, perfect answer there. For our last example, we're going to introduce something called Newton's Law of Cooling. Newton's Law of Cooling is an application of exponential growth and decay, but it's slightly different, so we want to be very careful as we do this problem. It says that the rate at which an object's temperature is changing is proportional to, aha, the rate at which something is changing, it's proportional to something else. It's proportional to the difference between the temperature of the object and the temperature of the surroundings. So it's not different. It's not proportional to the temperature. It's the proportion. It's proportional to the difference between the temperature and its surroundings. Okay. So we're gonna have to do something interesting here. Um, we take a 55 degree lasagna, just freshly made, um, maybe taken out of the fridge or something. We place it into a 350 degree oven. Ten minutes after 10 minutes, we know the temperature is 100 degrees. We want to know what the temperature is after 20 after 20 minutes. So we're gonna, it's gonna take a little bit of work, but let's work on this. Okay, we know that the rate at which an object's temperature is changing is proportional to the difference between the temperature of the object and the temperature of its surroundings. Okay, let's let capital T be the lasagna temperature. Okay, now the rate at which the temperature is changing is not proportional to the temperature. It's proportional to the difference between the temperature and the temperature of the oven. So I'm going to let y be that difference. Let y be equal to the difference between the temperature of the object and the temperature of the surroundings. Well, in this case, the temperature of the oven is 350 degrees. Now, you might say, wait, 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 well, why'd you do that? Why not, why not um, do 350 minus t? We could do that. It's going to change the problem slightly and it's going to add a negative, which isn't terribly consequential, but we would have to account for it as we go. In general, it's helpful, I think, to do the temperature of the object minus the temperature of the surroundings, regardless of whether or not that difference is positive or negative. Okay, so here is the magic of all this. Here is the magic. We know that dy, if I take the derivative of the left side, that's going to be dy dt equals dt dt. Their rates are the same. Let's take the Newton's law of cooling and take advantage of that. It says the rate at which an object's temperature is changing. Well, that is dt dt. The rate at which is changing is proportional to the difference between the temperature of the object and its surroundings. Well, it's proportional to some constant multiple k of the difference, but the difference we said was equal to y. Okay, so here's the magic. dt dt and dy dt we discovered were equal, right? dt dt and dy dt are equal to each other. So that means that dy dt is equal to k times y. So the difference between the temperature of the object and its surroundings is an exponential growth problem or decay. Okay, so let's make a little chart here. Um, I know that at time zero, the difference is going to be 55 minus 350. That's equal to negative 295. I also know that after 10 minutes, the temperature is 100. So when t is equal to 10, <clears throat> y is going to be 100 minus 350, which is negative 250. That will probably come into play at some point as well. Here's the weird thing. We haven't seen this before, but the initial temperature, the initial amount, is a negative number. It is negative 295, okay? Uh, all right, so let's go for this. We have um, dy dt. So I know that y should be equal to y0 e to the kt. I know that y of z y0 is negative 295. y equals negative 295 e to the k times t. In order to figure out what k is, I'm going to use this second piece of information that when t is 10, y will be negative 250. So negative 250 equals negative 295 
e to the hmm, t, t, t is 10, so we'll get 10k. And we go through the same process that we did before. So I'm going to pause it. You can pause it and see, um, do your calculations for yourself. And we end up with y equals negative 295 divided or times 50 over 59 to the t over 10. You can again pause this and look at the calculations. Now we need to keep in mind that we're looking for the temperature of the oven. The temperature of the oven is capital T. Y is the difference. So if we substitute the T minus 350 in here, I'll end up with T minus 350 equals negative 295 times 50 over 59 to the T over 10. And if I add 350 to both sides, let's write this in red so we can see it well. It's 350 minus 295 to the 50 over 59 to the t divided by 10. Okay. All right, so we now know what the temperature is in general. We want to find out what the temperature is after 20 minutes. So I'm going to erase a little bit of this. We substitute in 20 for t. t will be 350 minus 295 times 50 over 59 to the 20 over 10, which is 138.14 degrees. So we want to know when it'll be 180 degrees. Maybe that's the magic temperature that it has to be before we can eat it. Let's go ahead and substitute 180 in for T. We'll get 180 equals 350 minus 295 times 50 over 59 to the t over 10. Subtract 380 from both sides, we end up with negative 170 equals negative 295 times 50 over 59 to the t over 10. Divide by the 295, negative 295, we end up with 59 in the denominator after reducing by dividing by 5 and 34 in the numerator, and that's equal to 50 over 59 to the t over 10. We'll take the natural log of both sides and do all the stuff we've been doing before. And we end up with 33.30 minutes. Now these problems are actually a little bit more challenging, and the reason they're challenging is because we have to make that intermediate step of letting y be the difference between the temperature of the object and its surroundings. You might want to make some charts like we did. Um, just be very, very careful as you do these problems.